Hey church, welcome as we dive into our small group content for this week. I hope you have been challenged, you've been encouraged as we've been going through our King series, examining the hearts of Judah's rulers. This past weekend, we looked at King Manasseh. And Manasseh's life was really this balance and juggle between justice and grace. And I really want us to dig into that for our small groups. Now, what's so interesting about this particular location is I'm actually at the mountaintop chapel at Camp Allegheny. And less than 400 yards behind me sits the site of United 93, the Flight 93 Memorial, which was one of four hijacked planes on 9-11 and the only of which that did not reach its intended target. And the Flight 93 Memorial uh, plays host to uh, some special memorials to commemorate the 40 passengers and crew who made bold decisions and courageous moves and tried to, on that day, find some form of justice to protect uh, innocent lives and, and try to fight for themselves in a situation that they were never ready for and never prepared for. And what's so interesting about that memorial is there's one piece there called the Tower of Voices, and it has 40 unique wind chimes that are uniquely tuned to have a different tone to them to represent the 40 men and women that were on that flight. And the memorial sitting and the site of that crash sitting only a few hundred yards away from this cross is such an interesting parallel as we think about the balance of justice and grace. So let's go ahead and just do a little recap on Manasseh's life and his rule and reign. Now, Manasseh took the throne at 12. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 12, I was more focused on whether or not I could have an extra share of fruit snacks after lunch maybe uh, focused on hockey or uh, whatever television show I was watching that day, but I certainly wasn't processing any level of responsibility that would include ruling and reigning over a massive group of people. But regardless of the weight of responsibility, Manasseh just ran off in some crazy directions and made some horrendous decisions as king. And I wanna look at this, 2 Chronicles 33, starting in verse 5, and he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So he's building altars to false gods in the Judeo-Christian God, Elohim, Jehovah, his temple courts. Verse 6, and he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom and used for tune telling the omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. That's a pretty long rap sheet and a dark one. Manasseh really decided to go against God in a lot of ways. And you see it here in scripture and it provoked God to anger, provoked God to anger. But within that same chapter, you jump a few verses down, verse 12. Watch Manasseh's flip here when he decides to turn to the Lord. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Man, Manasseh certainly makes a change there and he makes a shift, one that we all have to make. Now, church, when we try to talk about justice and grace, where we often get taken off course is when we try to create this hierarchy of sin and we try to create this hier hierarchy of perfection and what God is expecting of us and we end up comparing ourselves to one another as far as who's worse than the other person. And we take man's concept of justice and place it on God's divine judgment and the justice that is woven into the fiber of his being. So we look at God and we assume he's gonna assign varying degrees of blame and punishment based on how evil you are. Now, 
when we look at this balance of justice and grace, sometimes we try our best to process this. But the reason we struggle with it so much is because in moments where we feel like we're acting out of justice, that grace is completely absent. Or moments that we're showing grace, that it means we're letting a, a criminal or letting someone who has sinned against us get off scot-free. But the reality is, what we struggle to process is that God maintains a perfect harmony of justice and grace. He maintains a perfect balance, a perfect unity of showing grace and showing love, even though we deserve His wrath, and yet maintaining justice within His character. To try and better understand this balance of justice and grace, I want to look at a couple of verses together. Psalm 135 verse 14 says, For the Lord will vindicate His people and have compassion on His servants. And that word vindicate, there's a difference between the word vengeance and vindicate. Because vindicate indicates a claim, that God has a claim on His people. Now this is the part that we struggle with, and I want to challenge you here. That under the covenants of the Old Testament, God's claim was on His chosen people. God's claim was on the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. But under the new covenant, we have been grafted in to that chosen people. And His claim is now on all people, which is why Paul writes to Timothy and says that he desires all to come to a knowledge of the truth, which is why Jesus is able to look at His persecutors as He's up on the cross. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, is a very uncomfortable verse when we decide to look at it in its entirety, put it into context. But you think about all that has happened, the scourging, the cat of nine tails plunging through multiple layers of tissue, through the muscle fibers, down to the bone, ripping back layers of tissue. The crown of thorns, most likely woven together from the jujube tree, and these thorns would have been an inch and a half long, plunging into his scalp, and our, our heads hold 20 to 25% of the blood in our entire bodies. You lose 50% of your blood, you're not surviving these same men who are scourging him, beating him, spitting on him, cursing at him, casting, his, casting lots for his possessions, mocking him. In Luke 23, verse 34, he cries out to God the Father in excruciating pain. And he doesn't cry out for it to stop. But he says, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Church, I know that this is difficult. I know it can be hard to hear. But all around the country sit memorials, one of them only a few hundred yards from here. And they serve as a reminder for incredible men and women, brave men and women. And we, when we visit these memorials, typically one of two things comes to mind. One is there's a sense of mourning, a sense of grief, a sense of sadness, sometimes thankfulness. But the emotion is focused on the ones who made that sacrifice. Or second, there can be a a feeling of bitterness, anger, hurt. But our focus is more on the forces of evil that brought about the necessity for that sacrifice. In church, this is, the, this is the tough part. Whether you are the one sacrificing or causing the sacrifice, Jesus died for them. I thank God that he has this beautiful, perfect balance and harmony of justice and grace. 
because I know in my flesh I could not be a righteous judge. I know that I could not show love and grace to the worst of the worst. But scripture makes it clear, there is no one righteous, no, not one. And the word makes it equally clear that he, that Jesus died on the cross for all. And this balance of justice and grace, I mean, look at the life of Manasseh. He sacrificed his sons to false idols. He was meshing them around with, with sorcery and, and necromancy and witchcraft and potentially getting Satan worship into there. And yet it says when Manasseh humbled himself, the Lord heard him and showed him grace. Church, we are called to care for, to love, and to protect the innocent and the defenseless. We are called to seek justice. But you and I have no say in eternal judgment. And that should weigh on how we forgive, on whether or not we choose to hold bitterness against someone. And I pray that none of us would ever have the boldness and the arrogance to claim that we know better than God. Of who's deserving of salvation, of who's deserving of grace. See, the beauty of the gospel is that regardless, it does not matter in any way, shape or form, it does not matter how those 40 people walked onto that plane. Each of them had equal opportunity, whether before they stepped foot on that plane or while they were on it, while they were having tough conversations and making brave, bold decisions, heroic decisions. But regardless of their life leading up to that moment, each and every one of them had the opportunity to turn to Jesus. And even if it was seconds before impact, the Lord in an overflowing of grace is ready to receive each and every one of them, each and every one of us. There's a quote written on a pane of glass on the overlook of the Flight 93 Memorial. And it says, a common field one day, a field of honor forever. And I want you to think about the cross. That one day, that hillside outside of a city, one day it was just a hillside. Maybe shepherds took their flocks over there. And the next, it was the location of Roman executions. And the next, it was the location where justice and grace collided and our salvation became a possibility. I know that we don't have answers for the atrocities that occur in the world. And I know that sometimes it seems so much easier if we could just take justice and judgment and vengeance into our own hands. But that's not the people we're called to be. Romans 12, verses 17 through 19. It says this, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Not just those that are a part of the church, not just those who have accepted Jesus. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And don't misunderstand me, we're not supposed to ignore evil. Just a few verses before that, in Romans 12, 9, it says, Let love be genuine. Abhor or detest what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. But then it says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. And what? Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Man, churches, we're called to show love, to show grace and leave the vengeance of the Lord, the vindication for the Lord. That's who we're called to be. We're called to, verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Church, I know that this may have been challenging and it might have made your stomach twist a little bit, but we can't ignore the truth of the word. That God desires all to come to a knowledge of the truth, whether or not we think they're worthy of it whether or not we think they deserve it. Because I'll tell you this, if God decided to play favorites, that'd be bad news for me. And I thank God he chose to sacrifice his son for each and every one of us. And not just the best of us. So we've got some tricky things to discuss in our small groups. But I hope you're challenged I hope you can have genuine conversation. Maybe work towards a moment of prayer or in your heart forgiving someone who has wronged you. But I hope through the life of Benasseh, we can start to see the beautiful balance of grace and justice that we have in our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, sometime your word confronts us. We know it does not return void but we have to open ourselves up to it. Sometimes it's gonna be painful, sometimes it's gonna be encouraging, but help us to trust that as your word challenges us, it's for our good, it's for our holiness to make us more like you. I ask that as we reflect and as we discuss that we can be transparent, have honest conversation, and that we be mutually encouraged and built up by one another. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a great small group.